Uh, evening ladies and gents, my name is Simon Brown from Just One Lab. So this evening's uh, boot camp, we're looking at managing and trading news flow. Um, and, and I've actually got a, a, a large chunk to talk on it, but I just want to preface it by saying that, that there is a ton of it out there, and, and it's, it's that process of believing that somewhere in that news lies the, the, the holy grail, lies the, the secret to your profitable trade and the like. And, and I can, I, I, spoiler alert, I can tell you right up front, that's not going to be the case. Um, but we'll talk through news, how to manage it, and then in the last couple of slides, I've got a trading system, particularly if you want to trade news. There are trading system which we designed many years ago um, for actually trading news events but we'll get to that uh, the this is number eight in the series we run to june and then we kick off with a with a new concept come july um, the first seven are all online if you go to just one lap.com slash bootcamp the first series of videos are all there you can view them you can uh, get them there and we're going through that process and this is sort of i suppose the eighth in that process and I always want to start with a fancy quote, and I really struggled with today's, and I, I, I quite like that quote. I, I, I struggle with it a bit, but just because I struggle with it doesn't mean I shouldn't accept it. Price makes news, not the other way around. We immediately think that doesn't make any sense. We think that, that, that the news is making the price, that news is going to be driving the price. But in truth, it, it, if you think about it, it is the price which, you know, the question when, 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 when someone goes on, on the wireless or the TV is stock was up X, why? It is the price making the news. Yeah. Th then there's a reason. Then there's a whole bunch of reasons. And, but, but no one's like, well, we hear that GDP in America was whatever. What? Oh, Anglos was down 4%. That's, you know, it, it, it is. But we get it the other way around. We get the news and then we sort of almost try and feed it into the price. Well, especially like a market is going to go where a market is going to go. I take it a step further and, and I... I I need to spend a lot more time thinking about this before I, I, I sort of put my head in the block, but I'll throw it out there. Um, I think the market wants to go where it will cause the most amount of pain. <laughs> think about it a moment. Let's assume a market is a totally zero-sum game. In other words, if I make 10 rand, somebody has to lose 10 rand, right? But it's not me making 10, someone losing 10. It's me making 100 and 10 people losing 10 rand. And for me, that 100 might be petty cash and that 10 rand might be your life savings. But assuming we've got some big players in the space, if I say to cause the most amount of pain, it's not just financial pain, it's individual pain. So if I can move a price to a point where I'm hurting 5,000 people, I'm going to be making more money than if I move it to a place where I'm only hurting a thousand people. I'm not sure. It, it makes sense to me. Just the idea that the market goes to where it hurts the most just to me makes perfect sense. I need to run it a bit more. But that price makes the news. It's the price that makes the news. We then sort of fit the story to it. The important point, if we take that as a given, is which part of that is then true? The truth part is the price. Anglo was, let's not use Anglo because Anglo was everywhere today. Um, you know, the, the market was down half a percent today. That statement is true. Price makes. The other part of it is, is the, the part where we're no longer actually in the space of, of now we're in the, in, in, the, in the point of opinion. I'm going to come back to that in more detail, but I'll, 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 I'll park that there for now. So is it noise or is it news? And, and, and some data. So New York Stock Exchange in the 1920s uh, had about 1,500, 1,600 shares listed on the, that exchange. Today it has 5,000. Other words, the New York Stock Exchange is only three times bigger in terms of number of shares. Yes, the market capitalization of that market is significantly bigger. We have a fairly large derivative market floating around it. But we're only three times bigger than the 1920s. We're only one and a half times bigger than the 1980s. Yet in 1984, the first financial TV show launched in America, it was one hour per week. We now literally have hundreds of hours of TV only. In, in America, it's not just the Bloombergs and the, the, the CNBCs and the like. It's the, I mean, the, uh, uh, CNN carries it depending on the market. It's the regionals as well. Um, but even in South Africa, I mean, we have access to three TV channels dedicated to, to market news. Uh, Business Day TV, uh, CNBC Africa, and Bloomberg. We have in Joburg, how many radio stations do we have in Joburg that do news? So we've got RSG, we've got Classic, we've got 702, uh, SAFM, oops, forgot Siki, Power, Power FM, um, Lotus, we get Lotus up here. 
We're up to six. We'll park that there. I don't know why it's popping up with every question. Um, that's just, you know, that's just uh, print publication. So the, the two oldest financial journals is Wall Street Journal, uh, launched in 1888. Uh, financial Times launched in 1889, literally a year apart. One was US-based, obviously one was UK-based, um, and both still going today. But even in an industry where we can say print is, 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 is struggling, print is, is, in South Africa, we have uh, two daily newspapers um, and other papers such as The Citizen carries content, but we've got Business Report, we've got Business Day, um, we've got uh, 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 a number of weekly publications in the print space. We have an, I mean, I want to say an infinite, a lot of websites, a lot of uh, social media, blogs, etc. So what I'm saying is we now suddenly have We've gone from a market which is, you know, three times bigger than almost 100 years ago, one and a half times bigger than, than, than 30 or 40 years ago, but we have a humongously larger amount of news being created. And the question is quite simple, is it justified? I mean, is it, is it viable? Is there, the market is not that much bigger. It absolutely isn't. Yes, as I said, we get the, the more peripheral stuff around it. Der derivatives were not very big in the 80s. Um, you know, the debt collateral swaps, the things that caused the crisis of, of, of 2008, didn't exist back in the 80s, never mind the 1920s. There were futures markets, but not to the extent that they are available today, and certainly not to the extent available to the private individual. But the concept of, of, of uh, uh, fundamental data out of, out of economies such as GDP and the like, uh, company data coming through such as results and directors' dealings, has not increased that significantly. Yet the amount of news coming out has. It's come out, I mean, it absolutely has, by, by magnitudes of numbers, we're seeing a lot more news coming. And typically, we look at this and we think this is a good thing. And we think that somewhere in here lies our trading edge. And, and we set up multiple screens to try and catch the news. Um, and and we, we religiously watch whichever TV shows or presenters, etc., to try and catch it and to try and understand. But it goes back to that point, which price makes the news. It's about the price. All of this news around our market is in truth, is it not just noise? And if anything, What's it most likely to do? So let's take the scenario, and if you've seen the other presentations in this bootcamp series, take the scenario where you're a disciplined trader. Okay? You've got your methodology, you know what you want to do, you know when you want to do it, everything's lovely, you're a disciplined trader. The only thing this is going to do is knock you off your trading. You're about to execute a trade, whatever it is, buy, sell, long, short, whatever it might be. You're about to execute a trade, um, and at that moment, some piece of data pops into your head and makes you think, hmm, makes you doubt yourself. As human beings, we're very good at doubting ourselves. And suddenly we're like, oh, hang on, and, and now we're not trading with discipline. Now we're trading on the noise. Uh, wrong button entirely. That one. Um, and, and what is the noise trying to do? I mean, so there's experts out there, and there are lots and lots of experts. And, and I, 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 I appreciate that I am slightly part of the problem because I'm also on the TV. But I must stress, when I'm on the TV, you should phone your friends and tell them to come around. And <laughs> <coughs> no, I made the man next to me knock his drink of water over. That was good TV last night. Um, my ability to see the future as an expert on TV, or anybody on TV, the ability to see the future, same as yours. Yes, we could say that they are a learned economist or they have a CFA level three and therefore they quite potentially do have more uh, experience and knowledge in the field than we do, um, but are they any better at predicting the future? And I'm gonna come down very particularly on that point because it's important, but it's, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. That's the old newspaper theory, right? If you want a front page of a newspaper and you've got two stories and you know one is, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, pretty little kid uh, makes flowers for teacher. Mm, not going to happen. You know, pretty little kid gets eaten by polar bear. Boom, front page story. If it bleeds, it leads. It's no difference in this industry. This industry is exactly the same. When, they, when, when the different broadcast mediums out there are putting together their front pages or their stories for tomorrow's website or their, their, their lead stories for tonight news, tonight's news broadcast, whether they're in general news or sporting news or financial news, they're looking for the big catch you quick, the big giant headline. 
Um, big giant headline this evening will be Anglo to get rid of Kumba. Uh, that's perfectly true, but they're looking for that big giant headline. They want the big harp excite news. They don't want the, you know, the, 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 the fact that actually, uh, you know, Anglo is looking like maybe they'll save themselves or something. They don't want the boring. They want, they need the hype. It's about catching eyeballs. And if we go to the point that, okay, there's a lot more people on planet Earth than there was back in the 80s or the 20s. So there's a, there's a lot more of us. Nonetheless, there's a lot more attention, a lot more people trying to grab our attention. You know, I don't know how many TV channels on DSTV, but I'm old enough to remember when we had SABC 1. That was it, guys. SABC. We didn't call it SABC 1. We called it SABC. So Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays was Afrikaans until 8 and English after. And on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, the other way around. And that was TV. One channel. Aerial. That was it. Simple. And at midnight, they stopped and they played the national anthem until six o'clock the next evening when they started again. That was it. And that was only 30 years ago. I don't know how many channels there are in DSTV, but there's a, there's a lot. There's a mind boggling. I mean, firstly, we have three SABCs now for a start. Um, and in fact, SABC Africa, I don't know if they're still around. So they massively increased attention competition to try and catch our eyeballs, to try and get us to be on that channel rather than the next channel, which is literally just a click away. In the 80s, if I, didn't want to watch, if I didn't want to watch SABC, it was really, really simple. I got my mother to give me a lift into Hill Street, Pantown, and I went to the local state clinical where there were hmm, two screens and I could watch one of two movies. And if, you know, if I'd been there last night and tonight, then I've seen both movies and I got to wait for them to change on Friday. Um, it's that competition. So how do they compete? They compete by, frankly, make, by sensationalism. Right? It's just as simple as that. You, you know, it, it, we, we have the phrase link bait. And you know, oh, that person link baits on Twitter trying to get you to click on their... Everyone link baits. If you don't link bait, no one sees you. And it's trying to catch the attention. It's why Twitter, you, you put images. You want someone to click on your post, you put an image. It increases the possibility. Um, not rocket science, everyone works it out, everyone puts images in. So we get that hype level rising when, in fact, quite possibly it's not there. Um, and, and I know from days when I've done daily TV shows and, and daily radio shows, um, and you sit down and there just isn't enough news for one hour, but that's tough. You've got a full an hour, so you make it if you have to. And then it comes always to the track record. One of the biggest problems in punditry generally, but we're talking finance here, so we'll stick to it, is that there is no, there is no uh, repercussion. I can go on TV and say anything I want. And no one comes back to me in six months and said, you said that and you were right or wrong. Now, we take it a step further, it's not binary. I might believe something today. And I can't believe anything 100%. Mostly it's, you know, it's, it's in that gray area in the middle. But I might be very, very confident about truth today. And things will change. And in a day or a week or a month or a year's time, I may no longer believe it. It's, it's something as human beings we're very bad at, that ability to actually change our beliefs, whether they're important to us or not. We cling on to inconsequential beliefs. I still believe the Sharks are the best rugby team in the world. I mean... I can't even produce the evidence anymore. And there was maybe a glimmer of hope 10 years ago. But we, we, there's still no sense of, but you said that. There's no sense of accountability. You know, and, and I know it's been tried. I know some of the TV channels have tried it. But what we're basically doing is we go onto these media channels and we just throw stuff out there and we walk away completely absolved of it and say, not our problem. Is it right? Is it wrong? Nah, doesn't matter. Question is, you know, did I, did I get more business or more clicks or whatever, the, whatever it is I was trying to achieve by doing it? The answer is you don't get the business or the clicks either, but another story. So you've got no responsibility, no, no feedback from the punditry. You've got if it bleeds, it leads. And so what have you got? Be bold, be hyped, go big. Don't say that you think <coughs> it's going to be a tough 2016. Say that you think the world is going to end, that we're going to get downgraded, and that there's going to be food, ri food riots in the streets of Johannesburg. I don't know one said that, but I mean, you know, go to the extremes. Why? Because the person saying that is going to get on TV. The person who's saying, yeah, you know what, 2016, it's going to be tough, but I will survive. That hope's not on TV. 
No, that, that's not leading, that's not leading. So what we're getting is that force fed into the highly polarized, highly uncontested, if it bleeds view. And it's not helping us. It's certainly not helping in our investment cases or our trading space whatsoever. It's fun. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's entertaining. It's great fun. But it's not helping us in any sense at all. It's designed to catch our eyeballs. It's designed to make us stay on the channel and not click away to the next channel. It's not designed to help us make informed decisions. I mean, I tried to count. So by my calculation, in one weekday in South Africa, so one 24-hour period in South Africa, if you were to consume all of the, the, the media out there, <clears throat> and I used what, I, what my, 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 my definition was what we would call established. So no disrespect to, 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 to you know, Joseph and Pierre, but we don't count his blog, but we count the web, you know, the, the established websites, and they're not the, the little guys on their own just trying to sort of rattle cages. You're probably getting exposed to about 100, 150 buy suggestions every day. There are only 450, 500 shares. So yeah, sure, last night Gary Boyson suggested, um, oh, that overpriced coffee people, Starbucks. So they're American, so, but, but the point being is, I mean, so, so frankly, what do we do? Spray and pray, cover the market, boom, all done. Nice and simple. It doesn't work for us. It's not helping us. And it's also be very careful of, you know, the man who called the 2008 crash. Yeah. But how long was he calling it for? You know, I, I have a friend, and I use that word very loosely, who was calling the 2008 crash from 2002. He would at one point mail me every Monday and say, this is the week. And then finally, when we did crash, when Neiman Brothers went down, he sent me an SMS and he said, I told you so. <laughs> I'm like, you know what, but I concede, you did. 500 times in the last six years you told me. You're not right. You know, there's always someone who called it. If you're getting this much out there, there's someone who went and made the bold prediction. Um, there's the Elliott Wave man, uh, Pretcher, Pretcher, what's his first name, doesn't matter. He called the crash of 87. 30 years later, his claim to fame is that he called the crash of 87. And he still gets wheeled out and says the market, and he's always, he's never called a bull market in his life. He's never said the market is going up. In his mind, the market only ever crashes. And he got it right once. 30 years later, he's on CNBC in, in, in the US calling for a crash. I'm like, the Oaks called it once in 30 years. I mean, that was quite good. I mean, once is once more than me, don't get it wrong. But just once. He missed all the other crashes. He missed all the bull markets. If there's that much advice out there and that much punditry out there, of course someone got it right. You know, the whole idea about a thousand, uh, um, uh, thousand uh, 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 peoples and a typewriter make Shakespeare. I'm not going anywhere near the monkeys. A thousand peoples and typewriters make Shakespeare just randomly, just bashing keys. A thousand people giving you stock tips every day. Someone's going to come out there looking like the expert. My grandfather, who aspired to be a con artist, <laughs> yeah, I know, but never was. So he had this idea for a newsletter, right? So you get a list, and this is back in the days of stamps and envelopes. So you've got a list of 10,000 people, and you send half of them a letter saying the market will go up this week, and you send the other half a letter saying it will go down. And let's say it did go up. Cool. This, you half think I'm a fool, so I abandon you. I go to this half, and I've got 5,000 people left. And I send half of you a letter saying the market is up and half of you a letter the market is down. And you wheedle it down until eventually you've got 100 people who've received a letter from you once a week for two months and you've been right every time. And then you say, pay me. And then they'll throw money at you because you seem like a genius. Again, it's just it's enough of the punditry out there. So it's the, 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 the punditry is just too much. It just needs to be bleeding. It needs to be leading. So we go to Shire Berlin, 1953, Hedgehog and the Fox. Two concepts, and this is, this is, it's been brought back a lot more recently. I've, a number of books I've read recently have come back to this. Two ways where people think. One is the hedgehog who views the world through a single lens, has got a single defining idea. That defining idea might be, um, let's take uh, quantitative easing, low interest rates is end of the world. That's going to lead to rampant inflation. Buy gold. And you ask them anything. You say, who's going to win the rugby on Saturday? They're going to say, buy gold. That's just their, they've got a single view and they're the bold prediction type. 
And they're typically the people who are on TV. Because when you say to the hedgehog, so what's your view on something? They, they're very charismatic. They're very opinionated. They say, end of the world, buy gold. The other person's the fox. Who, when you say, what's your view? They'll say, well, and you know, that would take you half an hour to explain the view because there's so many different input pieces of data. You know, we're seeing slowing GDP around the world, but that's been offset by lower oil prices. So lower oil prices are helping. Of course, the problem is, isn't that the oil and the commodity, you don't want the long story. You want to know what to buy. You know, I'm not even, I'm not even scratching the surface of giving you an answer. Um, the other has given three answers and he's on his way home already. But these are the people we need. These are the pundits who exist. They, they, I, I don't know if they're in a minority in life, but they are certainly in a minority in the media. But these are the people we need to hunt out and find them. These are the folks who are, 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 are give what seem in some cases to be overly long-winded answers, who don't answer direct yes or no to questions, who always say, but on the other hand. And that's the way it is. If we take something, I said a moment ago, it is not binary. It is not black or white. It is the gray in the middle. So when you say to me, what do I think will happen to the market this year? I will say to you, my expectation for South African and US markets is we will be red for 2016 calendar year. But that's not a binary event. If you drill into it, I support it. And I come out and I say, actually, I think there's about an 80% chance that we will be red. It's like the weather forecast. And remember, when the weather forecast says there's a 70% chance of rain and it doesn't rain, they were right. Because when you say there's a 70% chance of rain, there's also a 30% chance of no rain. So it sounds like a cop-out, right? When I say to you there's an 80% chance the market will go down. And if it doesn't, I say, hey, hey, I was right because there was a 20% chance. I, mean, I get that it sounds like the cop-out. But it's the honest answer. And it comes down to, and I've just finished reading a book called Super Forecasting, which comes down to the concept of, of we, we need to move away from binary. We need to move away from this black and white. We need to move into that gray area. We need to put percentages on. And we need to be quite nuanced in our percentages. You'll note I said 80. I didn't say three quarters, because that's vague. 80 is, a, you know. Um, and if you, you know, you've, you've got to go down and say 80%, 85. You've got to give it real hard numbers. Then we have to accept that there are, 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 are things that are going to potentially, over the time frame, change it. At the moment, I am bearish on the process, but something could happen. Uh, commodities, uh, platinum, all the commodities except oil, triple in price between now and Monday. Okay, hang on, my, my prediction now needs to change fundamentally because all of those commodity countries around the world, much of Africa, South America, us, um, uh, uh, Australia and the like, all of those commodity countries are suddenly going to have booming taxes and the like. So as circumstances change, we need to change our, our current view on what's happening in the space. And we hate that. We have a view, it becomes who we are. You know, my view of 2016 is I'm the bear for 2016. If I suddenly one day have to wake up and say, oh, no longer bear, now bull, the bears call me a sellout, the bulls call me a cheat, and I've got no friends. But it's true, things change. We need to be cognizant of that change. We also need to be cognizant of timelines. This is an industry which perversely has no interest in timelines. It's very different. If you say to me, where's the market going? I can't answer that question. If you then say, where's it going this week, this month, this year, this decade? Well, there are different questions. This week, I have no clue. This month, I have no clue. This year, I think it's down. Decade, I think it's up. And I'm using Bayesian theory on that. So Bayesian theory says, so why do I say I think it's up for a decade? Because every single decade in the existence of the JSC, our market has been green. We haven't had a, a red decade in the history of this market. And, and I'm saying, you pick any 10-year period. I'm not doing, you know, from 10 to 20, 20 to 30. You pick any 10-year period in the history of the JSC, we've never had a red 10-year period. So Bayesian theory says you start with that point. You say, well, over, have we ever had a red 10-year period? No. So the chances of it being red, zero. 
Okay, we don't accept zero as an answer, so there's a 1% chance that it will be read over the decade. And then you start adding more information to it, which push that percentage higher or lower, and shift it around in that sort of space. And that's why it's dynamic. But that time frame is critically important. I was in Stockwatch last night, end of the show, Juliette Tilevi says to me, what's your stock pick? So I give him my stock pick. And I'm, I'm a boring oak. I've had the same stock pick for the last three months because I'm trying to not be the unreliable pundit. It's firstly a stock that I own, you know, all the boring stuff. I own it. And, but she didn't say, what's your stock pick for the next X period? I'm assuming she meant three to five years because that's usually my, time, that's my minimum time horizon in investing. I honestly don't know if that is what she meant. I need to, I'm going to go ask her when I see her on Friday. You know, she might have meant, what's the stock for tomorrow? Um, I, and, and, and so where does that leave the viewer? And I can remember that. And I, I remember um, going way back, in late 90s, Alec Hogg in those days was on, no, I was in KZN one. No, way back. I think he must have been in SAFM. Must have been, because I was in KZN. We didn't get any other radio station. Um, and and, and <clears throat> I always liked the person who said good things about the stocks I owned. It was really that simple. If I owned Die Data and you said Die Data was a great company, you, sir, were a genius. If you said Data Tech was a great company, you, sir, should not be allowed on the wireless, because you don't know what you're talking about. So we need to, we need to, we need to do two things. We need to find these people. Because I'm not saying that, that, that this media, I am saying the media is completely useless, yes. But Lex, again, we can't be binary, right? We can't be black, we can't be white. The media is not completely useless. There must be some gems there. So then it comes to the point, and I've already said it before, in all of this news, there's simply too much news being created that every single person in there is, 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 is frankly worth listening to. There's some people who, with no disrespect to the channels, shouldn't be allowed on those things. And, and I know that's a personal preference and it's not my right to say who can and can't, and that's fine. I don't. But there's certainly some people who, when they say something, I pay attention. Not many, but there's some folks who, when, who, who to my mind, are foxes. And you will note that they never say wonderfully amazing things. They always pick boring shares. They probably never traders. But they're the smart people. They're the people who really think. They're the people who grapple with it. They're the people who will grapple with it in public and who will come back and say, remember six months ago I picked that stock? Well, it's down 30%. I'm going to pick it again because I still like it because I'm talking a long-term view. I'm talking five or ten years and six months is noise in our lifetime. As opposed to the oak who can't remember what he picked six months ago. I mean, I'm the nerd who makes a note of every share I ever have punted on radio or TV. And there's probably others out there like me, but there are probably others out there like me who are nerds, but probably a heck lot smarter at the game. A heck lot better at picking the stocks. And there's folks, you know, I think, I think one of the smartest minds in our industry is Gelo Giosi. We, we are an industry of smart people, but Gelo Giosi is someone who takes Fox to the nth degree. He's gone so far past Fox, he's, he's, he's worked it out, he's, he's, he's just, you know, and, and you talk to him. And I, I interviewed him last year, and an interview which usually takes 10 minutes, I say to you, what are your two stocks you like? And it takes 10 minutes, maybe eight. It took me in Gela half an hour, and at the end of it, he hadn't told me his two stocks yet. <laughs> no, he was telling me how he thought about the process. He was telling me what was important to him. He was telling me what makes it, uh, irreplaceable and, 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 and defensible companies. And I, I mean, it, it's like eventually after half an hour, I thought, you know what, it actually doesn't matter what his stocks are because I've learned so much more from that, I don't need the stocks. And it was a masterclass in, in, in investment lessons. So they exist. We need to hunt them. We need to find them. We need to, we need to view the hedgehogs. And you will spot the hedgehogs at 100 paces. We need to view the hedgehogs very much as entertaining, but but just entertaining. You know, we don't mean I'm not going to chase them off our TVs. Um, and sometimes they might say something erudite, but we certainly, they just the fluffer, in fact, they're not, they're the majority. And occasionally the foxes come along and, and they really those ones. So it's not that we turn our TVs off completely, although that's not the worst advice ever, but 
It's more that we say to ourselves, <clears throat> what are we getting? Are we getting it bleeds so it leads? Are we getting someone <clears throat> who staked their entire existence? Uh, Hank Paulson, who <clears throat> is the man who shorted the uh, housing bubble in the US. And it was an incredible, you couldn't just go and buy a put option on the housing bubble. It, it was a hugely complicated process to do. He started shorting way too early. I think he started in about 2006. He nearly went bankrupt multiple, multiple times, but he had massively strong conviction. And he was right. And his next big play was gold. And he's destroyed. He made, he made, he made, I mean, he made for his personal wealth, for his hedge fund, he made giant amounts. His chief trader got a bonus, I think, of 150 million US dollars in 2008. That was the bonus. Mind you, if that's your bonus, your salary doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> um, Paulson himself allegedly made two and a half billion dollars in his personal name, and then his hedge fund made a fortune for clients, an absolute fortune for clients. But this next story was gold. The whole QE, we, we know the story for gold, right? Quantitative easing, uh, low interest rates, lead to inflation. And that's not a bad thing. Alan Greenspan in uh, 2008, or was it early 2009, was it still when they were starting the whole QE thing and the whole, what was then called top? He said, you know what? The risk here is we get rampant inflation, but we will manage that when it comes because the alternative is that our financial markets just collapse in a heap. Uh, and, and eight years on, we still don't have that inflation. So we get the story for gold. The problem with, with, with Paulson is he's a hedgehog and he's still, so he owns 11% of Anglo Gold Ashanti. He at one point owned 15% of, of, of the gold ETF out of New York. He was an out and out gold bull. And for a while, it wasn't a bad trade to be in. Until August 8, 2011, when gold peaked at 1,900 and has been going down ever since. Uh, the reason it peaked then was because the U.S. government got downgraded. And if gold can't go to uninflation-adjusted highs after the chaos of the last couple of weeks and months, but he's still, he's still that hedgehog. And they're very compelling when they get it right. You know, his new hedge fund, when he, so he closed the hedge fund for the short on the, on the, on, on the uh, uh, houses in, in the U.S. He opens a new hedge fund. And it's all about gold, and he just gets money flung at him because he made his previous clients billions and billions and billions of dollars. And slowly, the clients slowly capitulate. They capitulate because they're losing money, and that's an easy capitulation. That hurts. He's losing money too, but he's a hedgehog. He can't afford not to. George Soros is a fox. You know, he will, he will think through a situation, he will make a decision, he will at, at times walk away. And yes, he does some big things such as, you know, breaking the British pound in 1991, sure. Um, and, but he, he, he's very much that person who, who doesn't have a, a binary view of the world, who says things are fluid, who when the British pound, when he, when he was right and the British pound collapsed, he took his money and left and went and found a new trade and has made wrong calls on trades. Um, and if you read interviews with him, um, read some of the books that he writes and the like, he's quite happy to say, you know what, I get it right, I get it wrong. The point is, when I get it wrong, I get it wrong and I get out. That's the key point. When the fox gets it wrong, they see it, they haven't staked their reputation to it, they can leave it. If we're a hedgehog and we get it wrong, we're going down with the ship. We're wedded to it. You know, I suggested a stock last night, um, and if it goes up in a ball of flames, I can adjust my and say, you know what, and I'll go back on stock watch with Julietta and say, you know what, I suggested it, and well, hey, I was wrong, that's cool, I've got other stocks, more tips. But if that's all I've got, I've got to spin the story. And I can spin the story. I mean, spinning the story is not the hard part. No, it, absolutely it's not. I've filled an hour of TV before in the first week of January, when nothing happened, except the market opened. There is literally billions of data points. This industry, financial services, creates more data points per day than any other sector in the world. Sport, probably second, but not a close second. There's a lot of sport happening. There's a lot of you know, games happening at, at all different age levels, at all different uh, sporting codes, uh, etc. There's a lot of sport happening, there's a lot of statistics being happening. But in our space, 
I mean, think about it. Every time you place a trade, whether it happens or not, whether the trade confirms, but you put a buy or a sell into the market, that's a data point. You cancel a trade, it's a data point. You do a trade, it's a data point. Every time a piece of news is released by a company or, or by a government or by an agency or by an exchange or by whoever, it's another data point. There are 100,000 shares every day doing trillions of, 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 of trade. There's FX doing even more trillions of trade every day. There's all the commodities, the agris the, and, 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 and the precious, non-precious. These are all creating data points. What we tend to like to believe as a human being is that we can take all this data, internalize it, figure it out and get the answer. And we can't do it on, either, on any of the levels. We can't get all the data. If we could, we couldn't absorb all the data. And if we could, we couldn't crunch all the data. It's just too much. It's simply too much. And we have tried it the other way around. When I say we, a uh, colleague when I ran SA Warrens, Manfred Harbeck, um, we got historic data because live data was just coming at you too fast. So we tried to get historic data and build models with that and see what, and, and basically that just came back. And, and I mean, we had Excel spreadsheet that ran for five days or four days. And it came back and said, no idea. Just no idea. Can't help you. If you read Douglas Adams, the answer was 42. So, our intuitive is that somewhere in there is that truth. And all we've got to do is grab it, find it, internalize it, com compute it. We believe that's our edge. We believe that's what's going to make us the smarter trader. That's what's going to make us do better investments and better purchases. Somewhere in that data. And it's not. It's all just noise. Absolutely all noise. Now there is a truth, we'll come to that in a second. Again, it's not binary. So within that noise is some, some noise in the signal. There is some signal which is worth, worth latching onto. What we have to do is decide what that signal is. Who are the people that we think are worth listening to? Are there data points? So are there data points worth listening to? Sure, results. Particularly if you're a long-term investor, results are important. Headline earnings per share, cash flow, that sort of, yeah, those are good data points. Those are, are worth having. If you're a trader, forget the results, focus on the price. So there's some we need to sift through. But at the end of the day, the few that we need are, are, are tiny compared to the billions and billions that are out there. Less is more. In almost all cases, less is more. Except for good food and red wine. In which case, more is more. So it's about the quality. It's about people are talking their book. It's about understanding risk profiles, time horizons. It's about saying that yes, there's some out there. And the point about the fact that there are some who are worth following is that they're not, they're not always right. They're going to get it wrong. They're going to stumble. They're going to make mistakes. Their answers are often going to seem to be half in code. But the easy answers are never the answers that are of any use to us. They don't serve our purpose. Um, so the only truth, there is, in the market, there's a single truth. Warren Buffett, and I disagree with him, but I'll tell you why in a moment. Warren Buffett says there are two truths in the market. One is the dividend being paid, and two is the page number of the results. Those are the only true statements in our stock in the market. And he's completely correct. And I mean, we, you know, I, 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 I read Jack Welsh's biography last year can't remember what it's called. But they had some issue back in the, in the 90s, something happened, one of their divisions had, had suddenly collapsed and they were not going to meet earnings. So he did a quick phone around of all his key managers around the country and asked, it was, it was coming up to, it was results. So the year end was over, they were between the end of the period and publishing the results. And he said to all his managers, if each of you guys can find me one extra cent of profit this year, we'll meet our forecast. And they did, and what great people. I looked at it and thought, isn't that called fudging the numbers? It can't be because he put it in his book, right? And he's Jack Welsh. But, but it's opinion. So Buffett says two truths, dividend and uh, page number. I agree with the page number. But in the internet world, page numbers are, are a weird thing. Um, and the dividend, yes, no, maybe. There have been, uh, there was a company in Nigeria that declared a dividend and they never paid it. I mean, the relevant, <laughs> no, they, so the guy goes to the, the NSC and says, uh, they declared a dividend, they didn't pay it, where's my dividend? And the NSC said, hmm, don't know. So he goes to the company and the company say, who are you? And he's like, oh, noted. So to me, there's one truth, price. Pause for a moment. 
and I'm not saying that our results are fake. I'm saying that even using IFRS, which is the standard we use in South Africa to publish results, um, even using GOP, General Agreed Accounting Practice, which is what they use in the US, there's opinion. You will note, so the US, every time they publish uh, the data, whether it be GDP, whether it be non-farm payroll, what do they also do? They do revisions on the previous number. It's not that they were lying, we, we hope. It's just that three months or a month or a week down the line, they've got a better view of the situation. And, and we d I mean, does the, do, is it possible to determine an economy's GDP exactly? No. Is it possible to determine the exact number of unemployed people in an economy? No. So there are, there are statistical estimates, and those are, moving po those are moving points. So there are at best estimates. So your truth is the price. Why? Because a price is where something pointy happens. Me and you transact. Or me and you. One of us is buying, one of us is selling. We are both, in a sense, putting our reputation on the block. Certainly one of us is putting money on the table. We're buying. And the other person is taking money off the table and selling. We could, in the short term, both, both make a profit. You could buy the stock at 6, sell it to me at 10, and I sell it to you at 14. We both made 4 bucks on it. But your price, as a trader, price is what matters, nothing else. A lot of what I was talking about there, uh, particularly around foxes and the like, yeah, important, critical, more in the investing space. In the trading space, it is about the price. And trading is, in that sense, incredibly easy. If the price is going up, you buy it and you go along. And if the price is going down, you short it you sell it. That's it. And if you're unsure which direction the price is going, you've got two choices. One, step back and do nothing. Two, call a six-year-old and ask them. <laughs> no, I tested it. So my nephew's now turning eight. Ah, oh, my niece is turning six. So when my nephew was, was, was six, and I, I, I can't do it often because my sister-in-law says it's abuse of children or something. <laughs> no, she didn't say abuse. That's nasty. She says it's she wasn't happy that I... Anyway, so I get him a chart of the top 40 and I show it to him on my computer and I say to him, which way is this going? And he looks at me like weird and he can't work out the question. And I said, well, is it going up or down? He says, it's going up. It's a stupid question. Anyone can see it's going up. I'm like, cool, sorted. And then I showed him another chart. It was Kumba. It was going down. And then I showed him something and he squinched his eyes and I could see he was trying to force an answer. Cool. We don't know. The six-year-old doesn't know where it's going. I don't know where it's going either. <laughs> what are we doing? We're trying to overcomplicate it. How do you make money in a trading environment, right? If it's going up, you're long. If it's going down, it's short. As simple as that. What do we try and do? We massively try and complicate it. Is it going up or down? Zoom out on your chart. Zoom out. Get a weekly chart and zoom out to a year's worth of data on a weekly chart and see what just jumps out at you. And if it doesn't jump out at you, find another chart. And if, when I'm, if it jumps out at you and says, it's going up, so let's take, uh, let's not take any stock because at the moment they're all just all over the place. You start on the weekly chart and you look at it and you zoom it out and you say, cool, going up. Now I drop into the daily chart and, and, and say, well, if it breaks the high or something, you'll enter a trade. Don't just, it's going up. You, know, you need a little more nuance, but only a little more nuance. Use a moving average crossover or something like that. But your price is your truth. That's the point. All of that media out there, those hundreds of hours every day and thousands of blog pages and, and, and newspapers and magazines and t uh, 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 radio shows, etc. All of those are opinion. They are opinion. Absolutely, they are opinion. But today, XYZ stock closed at a price. That is not opinion. That is true. It closed at that price. Is it a good price or a bad price? That's opinion. How did it get to that price? That's opinion. Where is it going next? Opinion. Truth? It's there. Our market closed at 43,212. I don't know where it closed, but let's say it did. That's true. And as soon as we say, so we start off at this giant wall trying to find the truth in it. 
all the screens and all the complexities. And it, ultimately, what you want to do is say it's about the price. The noise is entertainment. I'm not saying turn your TV off. You know, have the TV on, you can turn it down. It's nice. Five-day cricket's a lovely sport. The Sharks are a terrible team. But that's not your trading edge. And if you are watching it, and if your fox that you appreciate does come on, your best advice is to turn your trading platform off. In other words, either your TV's turned down or your trading platform's turned off. Because you can't do two things at once. There is, you, human beings cannot multitask. We, we, we know that. We can prove that. It, uh, there are more research reports out on that than anything else. We cannot multitask. You do one thing at a time, or you do many things incredibly poorly. Price is your truth. What we then do is we take technical analysis. And what do we do? So price is truth. Technical analysis is a derivative of price, right? We put it through a formula and we get an RSI or a MACD or a stochastic or uh, whatever else. What are we doing? We are moving away from price. But what does technical analysis actually, technical analysis actually do for us? It gives us courage to enter a trade. Because if I'm saying to you, ask a six-year-old, and if they say it's going up, then buy it. You're like, yo, but not with my money, I don't. And in truth, not with my money either. We need something to wrap it in to give us that confidence. And that's not an unfair shout. I mean, that, that's a perfectly reasonable request to say, I need a little more conviction than, than, my, than Simon's nephew. But it is just about the price. The noise is, is just noise. Price is what matters. Price is your truth. And your edge as a trader is then not the size of your TV screen or the number of TV screens or the speed of your computer or the software package. Your edge is how you deal with price. The edge is you and how you respond. And that's it. How do you respond to the price? And typically, we respond with fear. I, I was reading old journal notes. Uh, so we're going back now to the late 90s. Um, when I was learning to trade in the late 90s, if there were prizes, I would have won it for like the worst trader in the world. I mean, it's not just that I got the t-shirt for being a bad trader, I then lost the t-shirt trading. Um, but I, I, the one I was particularly reading, and oddly enough it was, it was uh, 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 Standard Bank, which is still around, because most of the stocks we traded back then no longer exist. Um, and, and what had happened was I wanted to buy it, and as the stock was running, it was like, oh, I should have bought it, but now I don't want to buy it because it's expensive. And then it would start coming back to my price. And I was like, oh, oh I don't want to buy it because it's falling. And I spent the whole day basically just watching this thing go up and down and up and down. And I was just scared the whole time. I mean, it was just like a day full of fear. Um, and and, 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 and I, so I keep, in those days, very detailed journal notes. Um, where I was, you know, points updating every 15 minutes and right at the bottom, last point is thoughts on the day and my thought was scariest day ever. <laughs> what did I do that day? Nothing. I watched the Standard Bank share price for eight, in fact it wasn't even eight hours, in those days it was six hours, it was ten to four was the stock market, it was wonderful. Um, I watched the Standard Bank share price for six hours, the scariest day of my entire life. It's price. It's just about the price. But then there is a time to panic, and here I'm going back. So for a trader, there's no point in panicking, because for a trader, it's really, really, really simple, right? You have a stop loss, gets triggered, you get out. End of story, no questions asked. We have touched on stop loss in a couple of the sessions, and we're going to spend an entire session on risk management. But a stop loss is a predetermined level, which you decide before you enter, that says at this point, I get out, no questions asked. So for the trader, there's no panic. It's either you're in the trade or you stopped and then you get out of the trade. And the best is, in places like IG, you can place a hard guaranteed stop. In other words, you stick it in because what's the weak link in the stop loss? Ha, you, me, us. We decide that's uh, not, not today because you know what? Something's going to happen and this is going to all turn around and it'll be fine. And you know, how low can African bank really, really go? The answer is easy. Hey? How low can a share go? Zero. If you don't believe me, two words. African bank. But in the more investing space, there's a time to panic. And when it's time to panic, my grandfather always said to me, not with scan, he wanted to be a scammer, scam artist. He had some smart things. He said, when it is time to panic, very, very seldom, but when it is, 
panic quick. And MTN was a brilliant example last year. The reason why MTN worked was because it was totally unexpected left field news. This was not, you know, when you, Nigeria is their biggest ge geography, um, and if they are now in, in deep trouble there and etc., this, this changes a heck of a lot in the MTN space. As opposed to Anglo, got, Anglo debt got downgraded to junk last night. That doesn't change the Anglo picture. Anglo debt was always going to be slightly dodgy. They've got so much of it. I mean, no one, who, who was going to lend Anglo more money anyway? They're a half bankrupt mining company. So the downgrade here is just in the Anglo story, that is very much more just same of the, more of the same sort of news for Anglo. All of it bad, all of it negative, but that's not left field. MTN, left field. We've got to distinguish between what is left field and what's just more, what's new, but more of the same, and what's new, but changes the game. And if it changes the game, it changes it good or bad. If it changes it good, lacquer, enjoy the ride. If it changes it bad, when it's time to panic, panic first. Now, if there's a fire in this room, what do I do? I say, hey, look at that. And while you're all looking, I run like hell. No disrespect, love you all. But I want to be out that door first. I mean, once I'm out, I'll hold it for you. But if it's time to panic, panic quick. And it is quite simply, is this game changer? Is this completely unexpected that has implications that are... I was listening, you remember Donald, Don, 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 Donald Rumsfeld? He had this famous statement in 2002. There are no knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. And we all laughed like hell. Oh, silly man. But of course there are. There are known knowns, we get that. There are, are known unknowns, things that we know that they could be there, but we're not sure what they are. So, an Anglo downgrade to junk is a known unknown. Uh, it's out there, it's not impossible, it makes sense. And then there are unknown unknowns. MTN, unknown unknown. That was never on a radar. No one ever, so the question is, was it something that may have been discussed whilst, whilst talking about Anglo, debt downgrade to junk? Something you discussed. Whilst talking about MTN, a $5.2 billion fine from the NCC, never discussed. That's how you know if this is game changer. Then the question is good or bad. MTN, easy, bad. Now you can usually tell, the f it takes you a second to work out it's a game changer, it takes you another second to work it out good or bad. And if it is, then if it's good, hang on. If it's bad, get the heck out. So it turns out that Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns was not as silly as it sounds. So then trading. So I've jumped a bit trading, investing. We're going back to trading now. We're looking at specifically a trading system for trading the news. I have traded this system in the past. I no longer trade it. It requires, um, it, it, it's, it's more for the, the, the day traders, the people who spend large amounts of hours in front of the screen. But it is a, it works. It works incredibly well. You can trade almost anything with it. I used to predominantly trade indices. It works well on currencies and, and stocks, but it, it, it works best on indices. What do you need? Ignore the actual news. So let's take a non-farm payroll coming out on a random Friday in the US at whatever time it might be. It doesn't matter what the news is. You don't care what the news is because the news is the price. The truth is the price. The price is what matters. So you don't watch the news. You can turn the TV off. And in fact, it's better to turn the TV off because why? When the news comes out, you will have an opinion and that opinion might inform your decision and your decision might not be the right one. So you turn off the source of the news and you watch the price chart. You could trade the S&P, I mean, uh, big US data will move every index in the world. So which index you trade doesn't, ma doesn't matter at all. You obviously know when it's coming out, coming out at two o'clock or whatever, five minutes past two, sit down, cup of coffee, tea, whatever. You're watching whatever your index or currency, go into a short time frame. Tick chart, I can't do tick charts. Tick charts, tick chart updates every trade. It hurts my brain. I do one minute charts. <clears throat> you wait for the first move on the news. And you'll know, don't watch the time, you'll know when it's two o'clock because there'll be a move. And if there's no move, there's no trade. But if there's a move, suddenly there's a move, whoop, then you, you'll see it. You'll see a one minute chart suddenly doo -doo 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 -doo, moving. Cool. You do nothing. You ignore it. First leg might be the false break. Second move against it. I'll show it to you in pictures in a moment. Don't stress it. 
Second move against it. Third move confirmed. So there's your first move higher. That happens to be two o'clock. There is every chance at two o'clock, nothing happens and you get no arrows at all. That's fine, you take the early afternoon. But if the news is big, good or bad, we're assuming it's, a mo it's moving the market up. We could, of course, flip this and do it to a short side trade. First move moves it up. We do nothing. You do not trade on the first move. You never trade on the first move. That tr the first moves are, you never trade. Uh, so first move. Second move, it goes counter. So it's gone up and now it's pulling back. Boom, line, entry point. Third move, breaks entry, go in there. That whole process might take five minutes, maybe shorter. So your first move, you just watch it, you wait for the pullback. That where the first move failed is now your entry, breaches it, go long. If it then goes lower, pulls back and goes lower, cool, you walk away from the trade. You don't go short because you're, you always are going to trade in the direction of the first move. The first move was up. So this news move is a long move only. First move goes up, you do nothing. You flag it. When we get the reverse, you now have your entry point. A breach of that entry point would be your entry. How long would you leave that there for? If it hasn't triggered within five minutes, the whole thing's over. You know, if it goes back and now it muddles along here, nah, walk away. Move goes up. There's your entry. Your stop loss is that point there. So you've got your stop. You've got your entry. I don't trade targets at all, so I let it run. What I would probably do is at some point, let, uh, if, if we start hitting the ceiling, I would sell a bit. If we move up to the third floor, I'd sell a bit more. <laughs> but what I mostly do is I'll move my stop loss up behind me. Here's the point. And as I said, we're going to spend an entire hour on, on risk management. So what do we do? It moves slightly into profit and we ramp our stop loss up behind us. Don't, we, I want to say it's a rookie mistake because it's not even a rookie mistake because I still want to do it even after 21 years of trading. It's, it's that desire to preserve capital. No, that's not true. It's a desire to not lose money. Let's call it what it is. Desire to not lose money. We want to move that stop loss as quickly as possible. Give it the wiggle room. Markets are not perfect. If, if I've seen this and this is only the second time I've taught it, and the first time was an audience this size, so I've only taught this to maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 people. But if I've seen this, I'm not the only oak. And if everyone's doing this, what does the market want to do? Well, it wants to come back here and cause you all a whole lot of pain. So give your, always give your stop loss some space. And again, don't stick it bang on the bottom. Give it a bit of wiggle room. Give a little space down here. And then as it starts to run, gently move your stop loss halfway up to break even. Run some more, sell a few, move your stop loss a little bit further up to break even. Don't be aggressive on your stop loss. A couple of points in this trading system. It is fast and furious. I mean, this whole thing can happen. In, 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 you know, I've had trades here with the entire trade, from news break to trade entered out the whole process three minutes. So get rid of distractions. Turn your phone off. Don't put it aside. Turn your phone off because your phone will ring and you will look to see who it is and that thing will move. No, I'm serious. If you're trading on a tick chart or a one minute chart and you look at your phone and that takes six seconds, that could be your entry gone. So turn your phone off. Turn your TV off. Nothing. You've got one screen. No dual screens. Dual screens is killing you. Dual screens are the worst thing for traders. One screen. We cannot focus on two screens at one time. So what do we do if you've got two screens? We focus on nothing. A little bit of Twitter, a little bit of that. One screen. Chart on the screen. You watch it. And it's nice. So you, it's Friday. You know there's non-farm payroll at 2 o'clock. Ah, cool. Your day's free. 10 to 2, you get to your office, make a cup of coffee, cup of tea, sit down by 5 to 2. By 10 past 2, your day's over. And there's every chance that nothing happens. You sit down with a cup of tea. I don't drink tea, coffee. A cup of coffee, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Nothing happens. And you start getting impatient. You realize nothing's happening that day. 
but it's nice, it's simple, and the way it's designed to wait for the first move, because oftentimes first move is false move. Questions on that? So in closing, always have a plan. I know if you haven't heard me say that before, it's because you've never heard me speak before. Always have a plan, and, and there was a trading plan. You know, people always say we want a trading system. Well, there's the we call it the one, two, three, trading the new. It needs a much more sexier name than that. We'll we'll come up with a much fancier. Word. What do I call? I call it the one, two, three, trading the news. For, uh, no, no, no. It needs something more catchy. Have a plan. Watch the price. Trade the price. As traders, trade the price. As investors, find foxes. Find foxes. And then pick their brains. You know, send, you know, they're foxes, right? So what do they love doing? They love thinking. They love challenging them. Send them an email. Say, so, hey, what about this? And even if it's a dwarf question, not because you're dwarf, but just because you, it's, even if it's a dwarf question, they're going to get thinking and they're going to think and they're going to, they're going to reply to you. You know what? Maybe they don't reply to you. It's an email. How much does that cost? Find your foxes. And then the rest of the media, noise, entertainment. Like the sharks, promise lots, deliver zero. I hope I'm proved wrong this year. As I said earlier, your trading edge is you. Just you. That trading system, deadly simple, what makes it work? You. Nothing more, nothing less. We are that difference. I always come to this at the end. Questions to ask yourself, well, what are you trading? Why? What asset classes and derivatives? Um, why are you trading mining stocks? Why are you not trading financials? Why do you trade stocks and not indices? Why are you trading CFDs and not straight uh, equities? Not because there's right or wrong answers, but because we need to constantly be interrogating ourselves. We need to keep on coming back to our quest to, to make sure we're doing what works for us. One of the beauties of the stock market is that we can do it any way we want. Which means we decide the rules rather than having the rules imposed on us. I don't trade that one, two, three anymore because it was like hard work. It wasn't hard work. I, mean, I had to be at my desk and I worked in an open plan office. I had to deliver on to you. I had to go to a, find a meeting room. And it just didn't fit with what I was trying to be as a trader and a human being. So I walk away from it. That's fine because there are no holy grails. That's just a trading system. There are hundreds out there. That's just another one. Uh, next session, we're back 15 March, we're looking at FX and index trading. We've touched a bit around some of the bits that feed into it in terms of equities and the like, managing gearing and risk, but we'll look particularly at FX and index, we'll look at some trading systems. We get into the sort of meaty end of the bootcamp series, so we're bringing in some of the systems, we'll bring in uh, risk. That's 15 March, back April, May and June. All the videos, justoneapp.com slash bootcamp. And you will find the previous, this one will be up tomorrow, of course, as well. And the rest will be available there. Uh, and then contact details. I've run my time a minute, but if there's a question or two. I'm going to get to them after. Mostly he just likes my hair. I like my hair too. It's short, but... Ladies and gents, we'll park it there. Uh, as always, lawyers, let's not make them rich. Uh, I'll finish with uh, three things. Firstly, uh, validate your parking ticket as you head out. Uh, secondly, really appreciate your time today. There was definitely a big pull on you today. Home to the aircon and the swimming pool. We'll come listen to Simon for an hour. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>